Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, tonight. My name is uh, Jason Lewis, and I'm privileged to be the uh, state senator for the 5th Middlesex District. Um, and tonight we're here to discuss what I think uh, is um, a very important topic. In fact, I'm not sure there's any topic uh, that really is uh, more important to our families and our communities, which is uh, public education and how we ensure adequate and equitable funding for all of our public schools uh, in all of our cities and towns. Um, let me just start out by uh, thanking a few folks and recognizing a number of uh, uh, officials who've uh, been kind enough to take time from their busy schedules and join us tonight. Um, first, I want to thank um, uh, Chris uh, Callanan, the chair of the Wakefield School Committee, uh, and all the members of the Wakefield School Committee for uh, co-hosting the forum with us tonight. And Chris will say a few words of welcome after, after me. Um, we're also joined by um, several other members of the Wakefield School Committee, including uh, Janine Cook, Kate Morgan, Ann Danahy, and Greg Liakos. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, we're also joined by um, Wakefield's uh, school superintendent, uh, Stephen Zreich, and who is also um, kindly uh, uh, co-hosting the forum tonight and uh, made available to us at uh, Wakefield High School, so thank you very much. And um, the town uh, administrator, uh, Stephen Mayo, also has uh, taken time from his very busy schedule to join us, so thank you very much. Um, also, Superintendent John Doherty uh, from the town of Reading uh, has uh, joined us tonight, so thank you for being here. Um, my colleagues in the uh, state legislature, uh, the delegation for uh, the town of Wakefield, so Representative Paul Roeder and Representative Donald Wong, who have been great partners. Um, we've all served in the state legislature for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, I, was, I served as a state representative uh, uh, together as colleagues before becoming the state senator. And we have all made um, school funding and the Chapter 70 formula a, a top priority uh, in our careers in the state legislature. And uh, they've been great partners in the work we've been doing to update and reform the Chapter 70 formula. So thank you for all your efforts and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Adam Weldai is here from, uh, all the way from the Malden School Committee. Um, probably traveled the furthest tonight. So thank you, Adam, and thank you for all your good work. And uh, also, um, Aldo, um, Aldo, Alderman Monica Medeiros is here from Melrose, so thank you for joining us. Um, I do want to um, also recognize and thank the Wakefield High School TV department, I hope I got the name right, for um, taping tonight's forum so that uh, folks uh, can also watch it at, at home at their leisure. Uh, I know this is a topic of great interest to, to many of our uh, students and their families. I hope that we'll be able to watch it um, on local cable TV. The PowerPoint presentation that we will be using tonight, uh, we will make available to everyone. So, um, you know, we, uh, if you've signed in, or just let us know if you would like a copy, and we will make sure to email it to you. Um, and uh, finally, I do want to also thank um, the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center. We're joined tonight by Colin Jones and Luke Schuster. Um, and uh, I'm meeting Colin for the first time, but I have worked with Luke before and uh, just does outstanding work on uh, a number of different important issues in, our, uh, in Massachusetts, but in particular the work that uh, Mass Budget has done on education funding in the Chapter 70 formula is really outstanding. So we're very fortunate to have them here tonight to help demystify uh, the Chapter 70 formula uh, for us. Um, so what we'll do in a moment, uh, Chris Callanan, Chair of the Wakefield School Committee, will say a few words of, of welcome, um, and I suspect some of the uh, challenges um, that we have with the Chapter 70 formula and school funding. Uh, then we will hand it over to Colin Jones from Mass Budget and Policy Center to take us through an overview of how the formula works and uh, some, of the, uh, you know, some of the challenges we're dealing with. Uh, then I will very briefly give a legislative update uh, in terms of what strategies um, myself and representatives Brother and Wong and some of our other colleagues um, who really focus on this issue have been trying to, to, to take to uh, improve and update the formula. And, uh, and then we hopefully uh, will have a fair bit of time to uh, take your questions and, uh, and feedback and have some discussion. So we're planning to go until, uh, until 8 p.m. So that should give us plenty of time. Um, 
So again, thank you all very much for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, and I just I, I want to welcome all to uh, Wayfield uh, our, our Savings Bank Theater, which is relatively new to our, our, our facilities. And it's a, it's a nice black box theater for the small groups, and we have some wonderful performances in this room. Uh, it was a, a great partnership with the MSBA to help uh, get the project uh, completed a couple of years ago. Uh, as far as Chapter 70 is concerned, I, I hope I'm not the only one that keeps banging my head against the wall trying to figure out what we need to do to, to, uh, to increase our share and, and find out you know, what is it that we're lacking to, to not get what we feel so it's adequate time for our students. Uh, you know, we, we sell communities that, that get vastly more money than we do when we don't know what they've done that we didn't do, what we can do. Um, and, you know, we, we've been advised to do this and do that, you know, oh, you won't you can get your numbers up on free and reduced lunch, you can do this, you can do that, your, your percentage will increase. And we've done all those things, and it only gets uh, marginally better. Uh, we do appreciate that the efforts that have been made over the past couple of years that have through the legislature legislature that will um, that have changed the, uh, the, the foundations and the, um, the allocations of chapter 70. We're very appreciative of that. We hope to continue on that. Thank you.
tight link between how well educated uh, a state is and how strong its economy is. It's a tight relationship. And it makes sense. The better educated we are, the more opportunities are going to be available. Everyone wants their children to get the highest education possible and be ready to be set up for college and career. So we see a tight relationship between the investments that states make in the strong education system and how well they do economically. This wasn't always the case. Um, if, you take, if you look back in the late 70s, industrial states like Ohio and Michigan could have you know, strong industrial jobs or a middle class job just getting out of high school. Um, and you can support your family that way. We know that situation has changed and that's no longer the case. So there's a changing world in which education is more important <coughs> and we should think of education as not just about having great schools and great academics, which is critical, but also setting up our future at the state. So in the context of the changing world where education was more important, Massachusetts, as we all know, passed landmark nation leading education reform in 1993. I could go on for a while about what 1993 Edward did. Um, a lot of folks are experts too on that. But when it comes to school funding, it did two major things. It increased uh, the state role in funding education, and it promised to progressively distribute that funding, recognizing that all communities don't have the same level of resources to support education, and also districts have different levels of need of their students based on who those students are. So it was a major increase in state funding along with progressive distribution of that. So in the first decade of Ed reform from 1993 to 2002, there was this increase in state funding by 2.5 billion up to 5 billion, um, which was a major change from the system before. However, in the second decade of Ed reform, I feel like I'm the Apple CEO here. Um, in the second decade of Ed reform, there was this leveling off or stagnation in school funding. This number back here is um, from 2002 to 13, which was $600 million drop in real uh, dollars. Today is more like around $500 million cut to Chapter 78 in real dollars. But there was a flat line or sort of stagnation and cut in Chapter 70 funding over the course of the second decade of Ed reform. And the implications of that, we all know what it takes now, it's different what it takes and the different programs we hope to provide. So I'll get into some of the implications of that a little bit later. So when it comes to uh, the, chap the steps of the Chapter 70 formula, I'm going to look at two districts, uh, Worcester and Newton, and see the four steps of Chapter 70. There are, there are a lot of technical details. Folks who are into numbers like us at Mass Budget, we dive into these numbers and make sure we understand them. But I believe there's four basic steps that everyone can understand. Um, about how Chapter 70 works. So the first step is that the foundation budget, the state's estimate of what the cost of educating <coughs> children in a particular district is established. So that is the minimum that we uh, believe it takes to educate kids. So in Worcester, that's close to 12,000. In Newton, it's a little bit under 10,000. So anyone have thoughts on why it is that Worcester's foundation budget is that much higher? special ed and English language learners? It's true on the point about English language learners. So Worcester's higher population of English language learner and low-income students will mean that we know that those populations need additional services to catch up on the English skills because of the lack of other uh, stuff outside of school. When it comes to special ed, the state assumes a set percentage of special ed, both for um, those kids in mainstream schools, as well as a smaller number of kids who are in these intensive out-of-district placements. <coughs> and so you can, that is something to look at, but that rate is set so that there's no incentive for cities and towns to over-report. Um, and when you're thinking about special ed, you can think about a couple of things. Is that number accurate? Is the assumption accurate? It's like 3 or 4% for in-school special ed, 1% for that specialized group. That is close to somewhere in the ballpark. But the other thing is, how much does each special education student cost? And that's where this, there's this real gap, particularly in the specialized placements where the foundation is something like 23,000 for those kids, where there's many that are, that are actually over 100,000 if you have these intense sort of live almost residential facilities. So those can be an issue. Um, but when it comes to the foundation budget, it reflects the ELL and uh, low income population in that particular town. So the second step of Chapter 70 after that minimum is set 
is to figure out a reasonable estimate of what it costs, or excuse me, what each town can contribute to their education. So we know that there's different needs, we know there's different ability to pay, so there's a uh, local contribution we can turn. Uh, for Worcester, that's $3,500, for Newton, that's $8,000. And that's pretty clear. Uh, Newton has more local income and property values than Worcester, um, and, it, and it should be expected to uh, contribute more, just to be fair. So once the foundation is, is set, the minimum, the local contribution is set, then the gap is filled with Chapter 70 state aid, which really the tax on to how much it takes to fill in that gap. So for Worcester, it's $8,000. For Newton, it's under $2,000 of Chapter 70 state aid, just because of the need and the ability to pay. So the fourth step is sometimes not seen as, as part of this process, but the fourth step is cities and towns have the option of spending additional money on top of what's required, and many uh, towns do so, especially for the ones with the ability to do so. So for, for Newton, they're putting in an additional $6,000 per student, and this number has actually gone up over the years, whereas Worcester doesn't have the local revenue to do that, and so they're unable to do that. So just to recap, they set the foundation minimum required to educate kids, Local contribution is determined. Fill in with Chapter 7. And the additional money is an optional part of that. So I hope those those are four steps. Um, although there's a lot of technicalities to it, those four steps are, are definitely uh, things that we think everyone can know and can work with. So this picture, this is the most recent data. This is there's a month more. It's more unequal between Worcester and Newton than even it was a year ago. Um, so this raises a couple of questions. First, the intention of education reform in 1993 was to provide additional resources where they needed. Now it's looking more like before reform, where if you happen to be born in a higher wealth community, you're getting uh, more resources in your, in your schools. And the second thing is that if this foundation was an accurate reflection of what it costs to educate kids today, why would you need to spend it? $16,000 on its schools. Um, there, there must be something that is not quite right about this. And so Mass Budget has looked at this question. It's been 20 years. A lot has changed in schools. A lot has changed in our economy. So what's going on? Are we met, is, a, is the assumption of foundation budget matching up with actual spending? So look at that. So on the bottom, you'll see all the things that we need in schools. So the foundation budget, if you drill into it, it has all the categories, administration, supplies, student support, teacher salary, and benefits. So we have all those mapped. And then the per student uh, spending on that is on the top. And you'll see everything's really in per student dollars. We think it's important to really compare apples to apples here. So the blue represents what we assume we spend through the foundation budget. That's the assumption in each category. The orange is what we're actually spending. So in a number of these categories, the smaller ones, student support, uh, guidance, supplies, maybe we're spending a little less than we expect. But the real action is over with over here, with uh, teacher health care and special education. The foundation budget is underestimating what it costs to do uh, a special ed program and to provide health care for our teachers by a factor of about half. We're spending twice as much um, as is expected on that. And that has dire implications. So if we zoom in on those categories, it really becomes clear. And before I get going on this, this isn't really a their overspending issue. All across the economy, healthcare costs have gone up. All the state government healthcare costs have gone up. That's not really under the control of districts. And then when it comes to special education, um, there's just been a demographic shift with more special ed students are coming into our schools, and there's a legal obligation to provide special ed services. Um, so this isn't just a choice to spend. So for, um, for healthcare, that's the foundation assumption. This is what we're actually reacting to. So we're going over by $1 billion in healthcare. <coughs> and then with special ed, if you add collectively how much uh, is being spent more than is assumed between uh, mainstream kids who are in special ed in mainstream schools and those out of district placements, collectively, there are, there are $1 billion more than is assumed. Um, so clearly, 
this is going to have big implications. We're going over about $2 billion somewhere, and something's got to give. And it is. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to group all districts across the state in, from lowest income to highest income, and in groups of 20%. <coughs> and so what's giving right now is regular education teachers. And that is really playing out in the understaffed. That's how that plays out, because the teacher salaries have stayed what they were basically assumed to be. It's been a constant growth with, with uh, inflation. So let's look at the, the, the low income 20%. A third less is being spent on teachers in our lowest wealth districts than is assumed by the foundation. A third. So this has profound implications on, on class size, on how teachers are stretched out, lack of collaborative planning time. The very students who were supposed to get under 93 reform, more teachers, more enrichment programs, things like extended time, because they're not getting these things outside of school, this is where the understaffing is the worst because there's no flexibility to put in local revenue. Yep. Are you saying that there are fewer teachers or teachers are on the pay? There are fewer teachers because the salaries have basically stayed um, inflation adjusted to what they were in 1993. So the teacher salaries are rising as would be expected, but the number of teachers that you're able to take on when you're adding all the costs and benefits on top of that means it's understaffing. Yep. Would it be fair to say it's not just classroom teachers, but things like um, librarians, art teachers, music teachers, those this positions going unfilled? This particular one is just uh, classroom teachers. Maybe you could repeat the questions so that yeah. folks who are going to be watching. That makes sense. Um, so the question was, is this also support staff for librarians or others that are being underfunded? Um, some of those support positions are getting less funding than would be expected under the formula. But in this particular example, it's the regular ed teachers that are um, in classrooms. So this is particularly um, tough on the lowest 20% of districts in terms of wealth. But if you go really to the top, the first 8%, they're all underspending on with their regular education program versus what was expected. And there was, um, in ed reform, there were certain class sizes that were expected certain levels of staff that are expected. It's only in uh, the top 20% of districts that are somewhat like Newton that are able to really have um, the regular teachers that they, they need. And cities that have the ability to spend what they think they should because it's really important. And in other areas, obviously, there's other staff. Yeah. Do you happen to know what fifth Wakefield falls into? I would say. I think it's either the, the, the fourth group or the fifth group in terms of on the higher end of income. Thank you. I was going to ask the same question for Brandon. Where do you think Brandon falls in? I think it's in a similar group. These okay. districts are okay. similar on that profile. Okay. We be we could um, for any specific questions like these, we'd actually be happy to look at the underlying data. This is a buildup from every district in the state, so we'd be happy to look at that. Yeah, we'd definitely be happy to follow up on those specific questions. Um, so this is the big picture. We know education is important. We did, we led the country in our reform. We built school systems that were not only just the best in the US, but actually internationally competitive. And there was a ton of progress in ed reform to just do that, but there's been a backslide. Um, and that's played out in the way that I mentioned with understaffing in particular areas. So, these are the things to keep in mind as we think about what's going on here locally, and, and I'll return to that. Um, so, I, I, it's an honor to be here in Wakefield. I think there's a K-5 at the Dole Beer. Is that right? Am I pronouncing that right? Um, maybe I'll get a chance to come out to the K-5s as well. Um, yep. How do you handle the teachers at AIDS? Do you put them with the teachers or do you exclude them? Because there, there's a lot of them. Oh, yes. Um, so how are uh, paraprofessionals or support teachers treated in this system? Yeah. So for the slide you just saw, that's just uh, lead teachers, effectively. Um, one of the other categories in the previous slides is a other teaching staff or something, and that would capture paraprofessionals. Um, and I can't remember what the story is there, but it's a good question. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe, maybe in terms of support. Yeah. 
But that's another big question. Can it work? So how does chapter 70 play out in the field and surrounding communities? Obviously, everyone's really interested in looking at this. And so we, we looked um, at these districts. <coughs> Things to keep in mind when, doing, when comparing chapter 70 amounts You have to compare apples to apples. So it really makes sense to use per pupil numbers. Um, so one town may get 2 million in chapter 78, another town may get 1 million. But if the second town has a lot fewer students, um, proportionally that might be right. It might be fair um, in that sense, that's proportion. And there'll be a student demographic that's reflected in the foundation budget. So more the LL and low income students you have, the higher foundation you have. As I mentioned, in Ed Reform, there was a idea of doing a robust low income program that would help um, low income students. And as I mentioned, you'll take into account the local property wealth and income of each town in the formula. And so, one last thing. Although there was no major changes to Chapter 70 since 1993, when, especially when it comes to our definition of what it takes to educate kids, that hasn't really changed that much. There has been some technical changes in the way that uh, the uh, state and city share is determined across the state. There was an understanding in 2007 when there were some changes that you know, the economic profile of every city had changed a lot in 15 years, and there was no adjustment to that split between the state and uh, each city. And they set new targets for how much towns would give versus the state. And some towns ended up um, being above their target of how much they give, and some were below. Wakefield turns out to be one of the towns that's giving a little bit more, a little bit, three or four percent more um, than its target. Um, so I, I might look at that data of uh, 1.2 million out of a 28 million contribution. So Wakefield ended up being one that was above its targets of uh, how much it's giving. So I'm going to go through the four steps of how Chapter 70 works with Wakefield, along with Melrose and Redding, to get a look at how this works. Okay. So step one, the foundation is determined, and that's 9,000, around 9,000 for um, all three towns. <coughs> Second, the contribution is determined. This is from last year, the most recent data we have. So Wakefield is giving more on a per student basis, 8,000, compared to 6 and 7,000 in Melrose and Redding locally. And then chapter that flows through to the amount of chapter 78 that is given. So it's, as you guys well know, but I mean, there is less per pupil chapter 78 in Wakefield compared to Melrose and Redding. And then there, each of your towns actually falls. There, there are some, as I said, there's some technical changes. There was a minimum $25 per pupil increase every year. There was some other ways that the exact numbers are worked out. That means that you actually end up being above your foundation. So it's, it's not like you're below what is required. And there's also the situation where all three towns are putting additional funding, uh, discretionary funding, that you guys have the ability to do. So that leads to school spending in the 11 to 10,000 range across these districts. So let me pause here and take a look at the picture. Take a look. Are, are you going to explain what driving that required was the contribution to get Yeah, yeah. So what did I find when we looked at this data and then the most recent data we could we have an actual um, so there was, there was a similar student demographic across Melrose, Wakefield, and Reading in terms of the ELL and uh, low income population, relatively so a small population. So same, similar students, not the same of course, but um, so that reflects the foundation budgets are very similar. Um, now I have the superintendents here, so they know the exact head counts, um, and there's some differences in how the state sees it and how versus actual kids. So there's something called foundation enrollment, which includes those, some kids who are half time and stuff. Um, but my understanding is that uh, Reading has about a thousand more kids than Wakefield. Is that about right? Yeah. Where people, where people actually matter. Right. Well, the, 
the main idea there is that, like I said, um, the, the local contribution um, in, in different towns is, if you have less kids and you're spreading it out, you could have similar wealth, which there actually really is in Wakefield versus neighbors. But if you're spreading that over fewer students, that is what's really driving the um, contribution in Wakefield being higher. And so with Reading, I believe it's about 300 or 400 less kids. I'm sorry, more kids in Wakefield. So that's really driving um, the, the differences we see. Not that these communities are that different. Does that make sense? No. No. Okay. If you keep saying you want to go by per pupil expense, yeah. but now you back them up. <coughs> well, we should go by per pupil expense. Um, but the same amount of money divided by fewer students um, will mean that Wakefield. So, for instance, on the local contribution, it's something around 28 to 30 million for each town. But that is divided over fewer students in Wakefield, which means a higher number uh, of the contribution that Wakefield makes. Yeah. I'm looking at it another way. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I've been really about this for years, so people in Wakefield are probably sick of hearing about it. Um, you said in your opening statement we have to look at per people that have to yeah. compare but what you're getting per people from the state in Chapter 7. And you also stated that the towns are very similar, and I would agree. Wakefield, Stone, and Reading are very similar. The answer that I want to have answered, the question I want to have answered is, and uh, Senator Lewis knows this, and he's actually been very comprehensive in his answers. Why does Wakefield get so much less per pupil in Chapter 70 than the other towns do? Okay, and, I, and I'll give you some numbers. If Wakefield got the same per pupil in Chapter 70 as Reading, as Reading does, we get about 2.7 million more. Same as Melrose, 2 million more. Same as Winchester, 650,000 more. So that is the question. So when you do your graph and you do the colors about, um, you know, go back to that, how Wakefield's local contribution, <coughs> that's because we're making up for the lack of Chapter 7. That's a big part of it. The required local contribution per pupil is almost two thousand dollars more than Reading. Right. Because so now they get more right. kids. And so you're going to talk per pupil, and that, that how many students in the system doesn't matter. So I think that, that I think that's the question. That's what we've been wrestling with right. here in Wakefield for years. Is that, and I think. Uh, uh, Mr. Callahan, the chairman of school committee, mentioned in his opening uh, statement, what can we do to uh, make that orange box bigger? Pop there. I think it's orange. Right. So um, I, I kind of, that's what I think we're hoping and waiting to get out of this thing. Well, just quickly on a little bit of the mechanics. So there is sort of a formula that says it's a set percentage times all the property wealth in the town. Yeah. plus the set percentage of total income in the town yeah. that goes into that number. And that number, which is called uh, combined effort yield, is very similar across the three towns. How much can you give education? But because that number is divided, if you divide by the number of students you have, we feel divides by a smaller number of students, so that shows a greater ability to pay. Yeah. But I think that Linfield has fewer students and right. they have more chapter 70. I think that they, their chapter 70 number per, per pupil is higher than Wakefield. You're, you're, you're right on that, uh, Ian Danny from the Wakefield School Committee. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 300 bucks per student yeah. better than Linfield. Yeah, and wow. they have plus There's a lot of students, yeah. So yeah. it's not just, and their yeah. property values are higher. <coughs> they have a thousand fewer students. And they have a thousand fewer students. They yeah. get more than we do. Yeah. So, yeah. On, on, on Linfield, I think, sorry. So I'm Luke Suits, I work with Colin at Mass Budget and have um, tried to help communities walk through some of the same stuff. Um, for examples like Linfield, it's hard for us to answer without looking at the Chapter 70 spreadsheet in the abstract. So we really would be happy to get on the phone and look at that if that's a useful example to compare these two. Yeah. Um, I also just think it's important to say, we aren't here to defend the system, we're just here to try and help them explain it. <laughs> Um, and by the way, that's not my job when I get up either. <laughs> <laughs> Just so we're clear. <laughs> um, and, and 
since I'm already standing and talking, I'll just say one other piece, which is we kind of intentionally designed this presentation to start with the big picture stuff and then get to this at the very end because the cross communities comparisons are important. It's kind of what you live day to day. Ultimately, the sort of difference between required contributions compared to the big picture issues with special ed, health insurance, cost drivers, thinking big picture about what it is we want our schools to deliver in the 21st century. You know, the, the assumption that underlying the foundation budget were designed before the internet existed. Education has changed dramatically. And part of the answer for sort of how do we get the chapter 70 orange bar to tick up for Wakefield is much more about get, encouraging the state to have this big picture conversation about what we want to do in our schools and, and get a little bit less out of the what's Linfield getting compared to us. So you just touched upon it with the with the healthcare. Is part of the differential between the communities have they all are they all including retired healthcare benefit in their per people? Is that factoring into it as well? Because some communities back in nineteen ninety three didn't elect to include retired health care. So are we really I know you're still yeah, some, some of those people. some of those differences were um, didn't people didn't think it was that important right. at that point. Now it's become hugely important and some of that stuff is locked in. Whereas I, I know Reading did include it. Yeah. So our, our retired health care is included in our program. Yes. Okay. I was trying to figure if there's something else that yeah, So made. those decisions were made back then when health care was really expensive and flooded through. Yeah. And this may answer your question here because we've looked at this closely. I think the, the 70 formula and where it starts to break from reality for me is, is the component of it that's driven by the income factor within the community. The, the, the reality is there's nothing about that that allows the particular community to actually generate any revenue from it. So you've got the property values, which makes sense. It, it's what drives the community's you know, property tax revenues. But, but where the income piece falls out of whack on a community by community basis with the property tax piece is where, is where it starts to fall down. On a state level, it's designed so that it's half and half. But in a particular community, you can look at someone, I bet you if you look at Wakefield, you'll find out that you're expected to generate local yield from that income factor. You don't have a local income tax. This is New York City, right? So how do you monetize that piece of it? I don't know what the logic was in that being one of the inputs into the whole equation, but, but I'd love to know what the thought process of how a community, you know, you could have hundred people move into a house making a million dollars a year. They didn't generate any income except for the property tax from that house. And, and we've struggled with it in Malden as we've looked at apartment complexes that are dense with high earners where, where you've added a whole lot of income in a small, you know, relatively small footprint. And, and, and literally, the decrease in 78 eats up all the property taxes that you take on because you're somehow expected to monetize the income. So I, I would look at those two pieces and I think you'll find that's the gap that's getting created. It's frustrating because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And you did say there was a component like uh, tax base, right? Uh, yeah, all the, it takes into account. Property tax. Property values and income. So, so for example, say uh, Linfield or Reading, if it's more rural and less developed, uh, conceivably they have more green space, the town may own green space that has no tax base. So in a town of Wakefield, maybe if it's 95% uh, uh, built out, um, Malden is 98% is built out. So there's a tax base there that's greater. And, and you can go community by community. And, and so the, the potential tax base is higher. So conceivably you're saying, well, if you have a higher tax base, you can contribute more. But obviously that, that, that $10 we have to spread around the town, those pieces have to go somewhere. And if it's going on a per pupil here, it's not going somewhere else. And, and that can be seen, I believe, when you go from town to town in the communities as to how roads are upkept or, or how the fire department system might look. It, 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 it's obvious to me, anyway, that when you look at the, uh, you, know, you only have a pie to split up into small pieces. And, and I think, well, I don't think, I believe the formula is, is not representing properly certain communities as described in the mall. Same thing for us. Yeah, in the sense that there are elements that are just sort of cookie cutter, they're just multiplication, and that doesn't necessarily reflect yeah. All we want to do is get you to believe us. We go back and <laughs> uh, We are very impartial observers. Uh, so one thing I'll say um, is that when these new targets were set for the local versus state contribution, there was a goal that the state would provide 17.5% of the foundation budget of all cities and towns. That was part of the 07 reform. Well, that wasn't fully implemented. It's like they tried to get towards it, um, and there would be 
immediately the revenue found or the legislation passed to make that a reality. Wakefield falls at about 14% of the foundation is provided by the state. So that's not reaching the goal that was stated by, by policymakers back in 07. So um, I'm going to keep moving forward, but I know there's been a lot of great questions throughout, so I look forward to that. And I'm learning a lot. So as, as Luke mentioned, we really do want to think about the big picture issues of what is the cost of education? What are the new innovations we've learned after 20 years? How do we make sure that every kid, no matter where they happen to be born, are going to have a great education that sets them up for success? And the idea was to open these big picture questions every two years, not let them build up over time. The idea was to have a review every two years to make sure that our system is matching up with the reality that's going on on the ground. So we have an exciting opportunity that's just coming uh, in this year um, that the Foundation Budget Review Commission has been reestablished um, in the state budget this year. And so that's an exciting process. And there will be open hearings. There will be more forums like this. Um, Mass Budget is playing an advisory role. We're doing research similar to what we've done in the past, but we're also focusing on one of the things we now know can make a difference, such as universal preschool for all three four-year-olds, um, better mentoring and support for teachers, um, longer school days in places where they aren't getting those additional supports. So we're working on that, and the project is called Roadmap to Expanding Opportunity. So this is where we're really focusing on, on the foundation side. What do we now know that's going to make a difference and allow all kids uh, to, to be successful? So um, I look forward to the question and answer period and, and continuing the conversation. Uh, mass budget, we're always doing research, so if you sign up for our email list, we'll, we won't spam you, we'll put out um, new research. Um, we'll only email you when there's a new piece of research. And I can tell you the bedding for that is, is tight. So they don't let anything come out. It's only stuff that we're working on. Um, and so at this point, I'll, I'll pass it off. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Colin and uh, Luke. Um, thank you, everyone, for the what was that? This wireless would be grabbing a box. This is good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for some very good questions and uh, and good uh, input already. And uh, I'll be very brief, um, and then I think we want to continue having uh, <coughs> more uh, discussion. Um, so just um, before I get into sort of the legislative strategy that, that I've at least pursued in the five plus years now that I've been in the legislature, first as the state rep, just on Winchester, and now as the state senator. Um, just a few observations, um, you know, in, in listening to Colin. Um, you know, the first thing is that um, there is no perfect formula. Um, and I think there was a lot of thought back in 1993 when we passed uh, the Education Reform Act. It really was a landmark piece of legislation. Most other states have followed our lead in how to think about how to measure schools, how to hold them accountable for performance, how to share the funding between localities and the state. Um, but but no formula can, can ever be perfect. I think in the 1990s, we had a roaring economy. It was the tech boom. The money was flowing into the state coffers, and uh, the state was really able to, as you saw in the column slides, you know, do a pretty good job of supporting uh, all of our communities, whether they're more affluent or less affluent. And so in some ways, that masked you know, some of these underlying problems in how the formula works. Of course, things changed after the tech bubble burst. Um, we had some tough times in the early 2000s. And then before we could really get our communities back on their feet, and I know that superintendents understand this better than I do and our school committee members, you know, then we got hit by the Great Recession, of course, and it really knocked us off. So that's kind of the context of what we've been dealing with. And I think because it's been so tough to just fund the basic needs in our schools, and you know, I hear this from all of our districts, it is particularly acute, the concerns about Chapter 70 in Wakefield and also in Stona. But, you know, there are people here from Malden tonight, you know, and Malden does receive significantly more state aid than does Wakefield or Orania or, you know, or, or Stona for good reasons. But still, there are many needs that are unmet in the Malden public schools. Um, so this is an acute problem that cuts across, you know, our more affluent community and our less affluent communities. And, uh, you know, and that speaks to the need to really go in and look hard at and update, I think, how we think about public school funding and how we try to ensure that it's adequate, first and foremost, for each you know, community, and, and as much as possible, obviously, equitable 
across you know, communities. Um, what certainly says to me that we're not adequate in terms of uh, what we're providing today from the state is the simple fact, and you kind of saw this in uh, column slides, right, that, uh, although I don't think we showed the average across all communities, on average, um, our school districts spend 118% uh, of foundation. So foundation is supposed to be the amount that's adequate to meet the needs of a particular school district, taking into consideration how many kids are in the schools, how many are low income, how many are English language learners, right? You take that all into account, you calculate the foundation. But on average, our school districts, our school committees, our city councils, our boards of select, and our superintendents and town manager are saying we need to spend 118% of that. I don't think that's because there's lots of bells and whistles, you know, that we're putting in our schools and doing all kinds of things, you know, that are unnecessary. I think we're just trying to meet those essential needs for the most part, um, maintaining certain class sizes, having art and music programs, you know, the, 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 the other supports that we need, and that's taking, you know, significantly more than the foundation budget. So to me, there's nothing clearer than that that says, you know, this is this uh, the assumptions underlying this formula are now, you know, uh, grossly out of date. People always say to me, so if this is so obvious, and Mass Budget's been doing their work on this for several years now, the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education has produced similar reports, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents and of School Committees has been saying similar things. So why, why don't we do something about it? Right? What's wrong with our legislature? What's wrong with our governor? And um, the, what gets very um, complicated here and difficult is that there are constitutional and legal issues at stake. Um, so what, in some ways, what drove the original 1993 reform was the McDuffie case. And in our state constitution, and this is true in most states, it actually says that the state is responsible for providing a you know, good, I forget the exact words, but a, essentially a, a, a good public school education for every student. That's a constitutional right that you have in Massachusetts. <coughs> Again, that's not uncommon. A lot of states have that. And the McDuffie case was brought to argue that, that we were not meeting our constitutional requirement because at that time, wealthier school districts were you know, able to have resources that were not available to less well-off districts. And then after that, when we passed education reform, then another addition, a new case was brought, the Hancock case, and it was still sort of operating under that case. So there are major legal ramifications here. There are major constitutional issues. <coughs> Um, as is true with many of the challenges we deal with, uh, it comes down to funding. And you know, if you look at some of those slides that Colin showed in terms of uh, you know the healthcare costs, the special needs, the technology costs, and how far above those are from the foundation, you know, you can see how that can pretty quickly add up to billions of dollars potentially that we are underfunding our, our public schools. And uh, there's a lot of you know. There's, uh, Understandably, a fear on the part of uh, you know, some of my colleagues in the legislature and uh, other leaders about well, you know, how how do we meet that? My answer is always we shouldn't be you know sticking our head in the ground and trying to hide from the problem. We should face it head on. We should figure out what the, the, the real need is, and then we should put together a plan to get there over time. We probably can't reach that in one year or two years, but let's put together a five-year plan or a 10-year plan you know, to, to get us there. So that's the, that's the way I, I think about it. If we could go to the uh, next slide. Uh, so the approach that, uh, that, that I've been taking to this, and, and certainly Rep uh, Roder and Rep, Rep Wong have been kind of right there in the <coughs> with me as well, is you know, first and foremost is when we do the state budget each year, and as you know, we go through the budget process just like our cities and towns do, is try to, as much as possible, prioritize Chapter 70 funding. Uh, because the state budget decisions are made across many, many different budget areas. Uh, Health care, transportation, mental health, uh, um, you know, many things. So trying to make sure as much as possible we uh, fund uh, Chapter 70. And um, although in real terms, the Chapter 70 funding, as you saw, has declined when you adjust for inflation. In nominal dollars, uh, over the last few years, it's actually increased quite substantially and uh, has been an area in the state budget that has actually gotten more funding, relatively speaking, than most other areas in the 
state budget because it has been you know, seen as a, as a priority. Um, so this, then the second strategy that uh, I've tried to pursue, uh, at least in you know, the near term, on a year-to-year -year basis, is try to get, uh, push to get every community to at least its target aid level. So you know, Colin talked about how back in 2007, there was essentially an understanding that every community, regardless of its wealth, should at least be getting 17.5% of its foundation budget from the state in Chapter 78. Before that, there was no floor. So once you ran the formula, some communities might be getting 5% of the foundation budget, some might get 10, whatever. Um, but there was an understanding that we would get every community to 17 and a half. And in 2008, 2009, we were on track to do that over five years. There was a, that was the understanding we would get there over five years. So most of the communities I represent were, would be in that category where they would be getting up to 17 and a half. That's true for Wakefield, true for Reading, true for Stone, and true for Winchester. I think Melrose is a little bit. That would not apply to Malden because Malden would already qualify for you know, higher than that in the state. Um, but then the Great Recession hit, state revenues uh, tumbled, and one of the unfortunate um, results from that was that essentially that five year process was, was put on hold. So now, in the last year or two, as, as the economy has recovered, funding's improved. We have got, basically gotten back on track. So Wakefield now, I think, in, when I look at the last the numbers for this fiscal year, is now um, about 16 and a half percent. So it's actually getting, it's still not at 17 and a half, but it's getting a lot closer. Um, and Reading is actually above the 17 and a half now. So that's the other strategy that we've tried to take in the near term: is just get every community at least to its target aid level. By the way, there's some communities that are above their target. They actually get more money than they're supposed to. And one of the challenges we've had is it's, it's bringing them down. Um, that's a very hard thing to do. I mean, you can imagine what you can. Um, so that's been a hard part of this process, too, is trusting communities who actually are over, essentially above their target aid level to get them down. But my focus has been let's get the communities that are not at their target up to their target. And uh, in the district I represent, that largely applies to Stone and Winchester. And we are now close to 17 and a half for both of those two. So then we go to the next slide, um, and Colin started to talk about this, which is really what we need, of course, and I'm speaking to a very well-educated audience here, of course, tonight, is you know, we can't just tinker around the edges. Right? We really need to go back in and look, take a hard look at what it takes to provide the 21st century education for our students, support, provide the support that our teachers need and the administrators, and all of the complexities of providing education today. And that really means you know, starting from you know, lo re-looking at this chapter 70 formula. Um, so what we are, we go to the next slide. I think this is my last one. So I have um, <coughs> filed legislation um, for several years now uh, to uh, reconstitute the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, this was actually envisioned in the original 1993 law because the folks who wrote that were smart enough to understand that the world is going to change and that you would need to go in every few years and look at the assumptions that go into the foundation budget calculation and see if they still make sense. And unfortunately, that stopped happening over the last 10 years. So there, there was an inflation factor built into the formula, but that inflation factor has not kept up with the costs that we've seen. It certainly hasn't kept up with health care. We saw that in Colin's slides. It hasn't kept up with the special needs that we've been seeing you know, in our schools. Um, the need, the professional development technology. Back in 1993, remember that? We didn't even have the internet yet. I think it was, what was it, DARPANET? Um, so, I'll go ahead and invent it yet. So, <laughs> think about that. I mean, we're talking pre-internet. Look at what we need in our classrooms today in order to provide the technology for teaching and learning. So all of that stuff has changed, and yet we haven't done what we should be doing. So the fiscal year 15 state budget, that, that the year we're in right now, took a very important step forward. We got the House and the Senate and the governor to agree to create a new uh, foundation budget review commission. And that commission is tasked over the next uh, eight months with looking at all of this data that's out there on, on our school funding, kind of data that we looked at tonight, 
listening to all of you um, with public hearings around the state, and then coming back to the legislature to recommend what the legislature, what action should be taken by the legislature and the next governor in terms of how we should update the formula. So it's not, it's, it's, it's certainly we've got a road to go down still, but I believe it's a very important first step uh, and a very important acknowledgement on the part of the legislature and the governor that this formula is out of date and all the problems that you're talking about tonight and that we're seeing in our classrooms, you know, these are real uh, and we need to do something about it. Um, it's chaired, the, the commission is chaired by the Education Committee co-chairs. That's important because the legislature has ownership of this. A lot of the reports that have been done, like Mass Budget does great work, but it's easy in some ways for lawmakers to, to be dismissive and say, well, that's, you know, that's a group that's outside, they may have a certain agenda. The superintendents have their agenda, teachers have their agenda. It's very easy to, I think, sometimes to not take that as seriously as it should. But this process is one that the legislature has stepped up and said, we have to own it. There are members of the commission that represent all these different stakeholders. So teachers are represented, superintendents, <coughs> school business officers. Um, Mass Budget has a, has a seat as well. Um, the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education, which helped create the original formula, has a seat on this commission. So there's a variety of commission members. Um, but there's ownership that the legislature is taking here. So, uh, we will, uh, I will commit to keeping all of you informed as to the progress. Uh, the commission is uh, going to be meeting, its first meeting is next week. Um, and, uh, and I can tell you, a lot of, the legislature creates commissions on lots of different topics. Many times, sometimes they never meet, and other times it can take you know, months, to, if some of the audience know what I'm talking about, it can take months if not years before they finally meet. This one is different. It was, it was created in the FY15 budget just a few months ago. The members have been named. The governor named his members to the commission. The Senate president and the Speaker of the House named their members. They're taking this seriously. Um, uh, I will be working very closely with the commission. I'm meeting with one of the commission members tomorrow, actually, uh, State Senator Pat Jalen, because she knows how much work I've done on this area. We're going to be talking about it. Um, all of you, as I said, will have a chance to you know, attend these public hearings or provide written input. And, uh, you know, we've got, uh, this is not going to be an easy road. It's not going to get fixed overnight, but I do think this is a very important step and will lead us down a path that I, I'm very hopeful ultimately will lead us to, to updating the formula. It will never be perfect, but I think we will seek to ensure we have more adequate and more equitable funding, you know, for, for every, uh, every community. And in the meantime, we'll certainly continue in the short term, again, like I said earlier, to try to make sure we can maximize that funding you know, that's available each year because you know, each child is only in third grade once, they're only seniors once, they only have one shot. So we can't wait. We have to do as much as we can for, for them as they go through school. All right, so I think that's uh, all I had. And um, let's uh, maybe, do you want to join me back up here? I'll be later. We um, kind of pick up maybe the, the discussion where we left off. All kind of further, yep, further questions. Uh, let's see um, if the best way for the sound wise is to do the questions at their seat or, or come up here, perhaps. Did you say this might work? Okay. I'm happy to speak up. Okay. okay. Um, I, I don't know if that's a thing that like, will be picked up by the mic or not, but a, a question for Colin and Luke. I wonder if you could walk us through the formula for the combined effort yield in a little more detail. Um, so, do you have the percentages here? Yeah. So this, I think it, it might have been you earlier, or someone in this part of the auditorium acknowledged. So, the the goal statewide is to have basically <coughs> half of the local effort come from property wealth and the other half from incomes. That's and then so the state kind of backs out each year. A percentage that will be applied to every community's property wealth and every community's income. So, for 20, so just as an example, um, this is for FY15. 036 percent of every community's property wealth is added to 1.5 percent of every community's income. 
those two summed together generate your community's combined effort yield. And I think Colin said it's roughly. Um, now it's important to keep it, this is getting weedy, so I'll, I won't go too deep here. But it's important to remember that that number is every community's target contribution, which is different from what their actual contribution might be. And that's, the way I think of it is that the state continues to calculate every community's required contribution <coughs> two ways. Basically using the old method, which is then compared to the new method, the target, some communities are above, like Wakefield, some are still below, and the state's trying to get everybody over time closer to that target. So it seems to me that the um, person that has pointed out the dependence on income doesn't really seem like it should play a factor because we don't pay our income tax to our individual communities. So I mean, can there be some reform I mean, could that be something that, you know, have you ever done any research into that saying that that is something that's unfair to communities? And it seems like that could be some, somewhat of a tipping point for Lakefield. So what you're raising is an interesting policy question. And actually, it used to be that the formula only looked at property wealth. So a reform that happened actually more recently was in the opposite direction, to add the income measure. And again, this is not to defend it, this is just to kind of outline the justification. The argument was um, there are communities that are, I want to make sure I get the direction right. Um, uh, well, the, the, more simply put, um, people pay their property tax bills with their income. So there's an argument that you should factor in income levels when looking at ability to pay more broadly at the local level. That doesn't mean you're not raising a valid concern, because which is that- You're really capturing the chapter 70 formula. Income is already being, being captured in the number of free and reduced lunches. And in, you know, I'm sure that there are other things that calculate the income of the low income percent <coughs> of the school district, that that is part of the chapter 70 formula, right? No, you're not wrong, but there are interesting outliers on that front, too. So, for example, Boston's actually a really interesting example where Boston is both very high poverty in terms of the kids in its schools, but actually very high wealth in terms of its taxpayers. And so you want a formula that kind of captures both of those. So it's sort of high needs, but actually high ability to pay, too. Um, Cambridge and Somerville, some of the greater Boston area. Cambridge, interesting. I actually, in a former life, used to be on the Cambridge School Committee. Um, and uh, Cambridge is a crazy example where Cambridge, if you looked at just its combined effort yield, that's actually higher on its own than Cambridge's foundation budget. Um, so there are a few outliers that could entirely fund their local school requ spending requirements off of local resources. But not everyone has Kendall Square, so. <laughs> Do you, have you, uh, have you, Looked into where uh, I've seen this from for many years ago. But where Massachusetts ranks, um, you know, among the 50 states and the amount of state funding for education. I, I've heard that we rely a lot great, to a lot greater extent on local revenue for education than some other states. Could you enlighten us on that? Just before you answer, I'm sorry, I couldn't see with the light, but that's actually Susan Radicchio who's joined us from the Winchester School Committee. So we have looked a little bit at this. Um, the US Census Bureau releases a report that's useful every year that looks at 50 state comparisons and has a useful breakdown, which is looks at state contributions, local contributions, and federal contributions to schools. And um, most of the New England states are heavily dependent on local revenue. That's gotten better in Massachusetts over the last 20 years of ed reform, where the state committed to contributing more. Um, but we're still below, I think, the national average. The place where we are by far the lowest is in the federal contribution to our schools. Um, most of the federal dollars flow to schools through Title I and IDEA, special education funding, and as a relatively wealthy state, we get a lot less of that federal support. In states that, states that get a lot of that federal money, states that get a lot of the federal money, even though there's a lot of talk about smaller government, they're never talking about taking less um, Title I. <laughs> <laughs> so another trigger 
formula is that if you have more students in your school system, if you have more students in your school system, you're going to tend to, to jump that Chapter 70 formula in terms of the distribution of your property wealth. The same property wealth over fewer students is going to be, I think Colin was pointing that out, it's going to be meaning that you distributed more, you know, um, more towards the local students, the fewer students you have. So that makes the argument that, you know, what Chris's question is, what can we do? And I think the answer is, is that we need to work in increasing our student population. We need to increase the number of students. So the only way we do that is to, as a community, continue to invest in education. I mean, that's going to trigger it, is that when people are looking to move, they will to, you know, moving, you know, maybe even the Galvin will help that, because that might make us a more attractive community of people. So I think that, yeah, the early childhood center. So I, I think that that's something long-term investment. But I think it's a formula. There's something really, and that's nobody that can seem to point to what that is, that why Wakefield does so much worse than our neighboring communities. Like our neighboring communities have fewer students, higher wealth are getting more. So I'd be really curious to see the whole Wakefield example. Um, so, so there's a couple things that go into that, as you saw. You know, the, the, the key is that that required contribution that Wakefield is being required today is higher than you know, right. per pupil than Reading and Naros. So part of that is what Colin was explaining is um, because there are fewer students, but similar, say, wealth, um, you know, this property or income wealth, you know, spreading that over a smaller number of students. So it's, you know, that's why it's higher per student. But also, the formula really, it's sort of, um, it doesn't start, it, the way to uh, the best I explain this is it doesn't sort of baseline every year, you know, from scratch. It sort of builds on itself year to year. Mm -hmm. So where, you know, Wakefield was the year before in terms of what its required contribution is, the formula essentially just puts a, what's called a municipal revenue growth factor on that. So it just, it essentially, escalates it each year in terms of what each community is able to contribute. So when you have some of these inequities that are kind of gotten in there, they continue year to year because you're basically not baseline in that again. So that's part of why it just continues in year to year. Wakefield already built in, and then you, each year Wakefield is required to contribute, you know, an additional uh, two to three percent, you know, so it's supposed to reflect inflation. Uh, Greg. So um, I, I was just thinking that it's important for us as school committee members and educators and others to um, think about how we can continue to advance this um, this process as advocates. Um, I imagine you know for you know the Massachusetts Association of School Committee, the Association of School Superintendents are going to be watching this closely. But I think um, you were pointing out you know how important it is for the legislature to to feel the urgency um, uh, for for the outcome of this process to be, um, you know, uh, to, 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 to do what we wanted to do, which is to, to have a, a better and more equitable funding system for our public schools. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what else we can we can plan to do to keep the, keep the feet to the fire. Okay, let me answer that. But I, I just remembered uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say to Anne's question, which was to concur with you that you know, when you do see enrollment growth, uh, that does really help because the enrollment is a key piece that goes into calculation of the foundation budget. <laughs> so that growing enrollment does grow the foundation and is, and is helpful. Um, so I, I just wanted to echo that, you know, uh, investing in our school systems, I think the new Galvin Middle School, I think the new Stoneman Middle School, um, you know, these kinds of investments will, will pay those kind of dividends, not just in new facilities that are first rate, but also it will help to, I think, grow the student population, which has a, the, the benefit of then translating to more Chapter 70. But to uh, Greg's question, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees <coughs> and of the super, school superintendents have uh, a seat on the commission, so they will be participating very directly. I suspect all the school committee members in here and the superintendents get regular correspondence right, with your association. So I'm sure they will be sending out regular you know, bulletins on here's what's happening, here's when the next public forum is, and all that. And I will do the same thing as well. Um, so I think as much as we can, sharing 
our stories from our own you know, individual communities, the challenges we're facing, you know, all the cuts that we've had to make you know, in our schools, and, and sharing that, sharing that in writing, sharing that um, in a testimony. Um, I know it's hard because many of us in this room, I'm sure, feel like you've been do doing this for years and years, and you just get tired. Um, you know, but I think we have to just get a second wind here and, and really try to make this effort you know, over the next year to follow the process, participate in it, again, share the stories that, that we all face in each of our, you know, with each one, I'm sure every person in this room can talk about you know, the tough cuts that have, we have to make and the needs that are unmet, and I uh, think uh, make sure you know, that that's heard loud and clear by the members. So, you said that uh, in 2007 there was an effort made to put 17 and percent, correct? Yes. And then um, during that time, Wakefield has yet to meet that. We have gotten some increases. Yes. Isn't it true though that other communities have also gotten the same increases? Hasn't, hasn't there been some broad brush increases across all communities when you still have other communities that are below 17 and a half? So. There is, uh, so the, yes, because the, the legislature has, <coughs> and I, uh, uh, this is not something I've agreed with, but in general, the legislature has sort of, um, you know, each year wanted to give a little bit more to everyone. So, you know, $25 more per student, I think some years we've done 50. So there's been sort of um, almost an end run around the formula to just be able to give a little bit more uh, to, to each community. And the formula still does try to make some adjustments for those who are above their target or below their target. But you're right, if that's, you know, that's what we should be focusing on is any extra money should be going to the communities that are below their targets and we should be you know, doing the hard work of the communities that are above their targets and bringing them down. Um, but politically, that's not easy, and so there has been some peanut buttering around of uh, some of the increase that the, that the state's been able to, to put into it. Um, so that has made it a little, it's, it's made it taking, it's taking longer to get to where we should be. By the way, 17.5% is not in, this was a big surprise to me actually when I, when I learned this, not in statute. So it was a, basically an agreement that was reached by the leaders of the House and the Senate at that time, back in 2007. Sort of a verbal agreement, and that's hard to believe. Never actually in statute. So one of the things I've tried to put forward a number of times um, in bills or in amendments to bills is to put that in statute so that if there's a statutory requirement to get communities to at least 17.5% of the foundation, we haven't actually been successful. So far, so where is the other position? Well, I think that there there were people who never wanted to do that back in 2007. Yeah, you know, there there are some of my colleagues who feel that if a community, Cambridge. for example, in Cambridge, has the ability, based on their wealth, to more than cover the cost of their schools, they shouldn't be getting a penny from the state in, in Chapter 78. You know, and before that change was made, there were communities who, you know, I don't know that they were getting nothing from the state, but they were they were getting significantly less than 17.5%. Um, but, and I wasn't around for the debate at that time, but I think there was a fear that our whole school funding system could collapse if you had essentially you know, wealthy communities kind of pulling out of it. You, they, they would be in revolt because you'd have these wealthy communities that would argue that you know, we're paying a large share of the income taxes um, that are funding the state budget, and yet we're not getting back you know, much at all for our schools, which is their biggest concern. So I think it was an attempt to try to balance all these competing interests and to satisfy all these interests and say, okay, at least we'll make sure every city or town, regardless of its wealth, you know, we'll get at least this, this minimum amount from the state. Now my, my, you know, whether or not people agree with that, my view is that was an, an understanding and we should meet that commitment. Um, but uh, there are still people, you know, in the legislature, I think, who probably don't necessarily get, uh, buy into that uh, that premise. Yeah, John. The uh, commission, the legislature just established. Uh, we'll be looking at the foundation budget. We'll also be looking at the other components of the formula, 
the economic contribution and that sort of thing, or is it limited to the, to the foundation budget? So that the, the, the very good question. The, the strict language that we put in the state budget to authorize this commission um, mainly points to the foundation budget. It's mainly the mission is to look at that the foundation budget and 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 look at what's needed broadly to deliver the education that we should we need to deliver for the 21st century and and what's the you know most efficient way to do that and what resources are required to do that. So that's. That is the primary focus. But my view is it's hard to completely separate these things. They're all interdependent. So in looking at the foundation, I think we will have to be looking at issues as well. Uh, the ones that we're bringing up here is, well, what's the, the municipality's responsibility you know, in meeting the foundation budget, and what's the state's responsibility in meeting that? Um, so you know, I think it's one step at a time. But certainly my intent is, depending on how far this commission goes and where they end up, you know, the very next day I'll be pushing if I feel like they've not addressed, <coughs> you know, some of these questions around uh, uh, the other parts of the formula and how it's calculated. You know, my intent will be to kind of push forward, with, you know, with, with that um, right away. Yep. Yeah. Jason, you had on something earlier that, that also ties to the, the municipal growth factor is, is, is part of the equation that's really got to be looked at. It's, you know, it's the piece that will dictate what a community is going to grow year to year, sort of, you know, local uh, local effort be damned. Yes. And it's based upon budget, not actual. Uh, yes. and, and so if you look across, there's absolutely communities that sandbag the budget numbers, knowing that it will, it will at least uh, appear that they have less local revenue to, you know, to add to the pie <laughs> here. Uh, yeah, I've, I've talked to the Dewey about this, and they, they agree that, that that really doesn't make any sense. And the categories they picked up in it are, are really almost random. There, there are pieces that should be and that aren't, and, and yet we found out molded that they were picking up as revenue uh, an overborrowing we had done that we were advertising back in over a 10 year period. They were treating that as if it was a local receipt available to pay for schools. And, and, and so the whole, that whole piece of it really, we found, can really bite you if you don't understand how it's working and, and make sure that you don't have it you know, purchased. So it's something that's gotta be looked at in this process. Great um, the, it's important to note that part of the 07 reforms is to get the state off of using the municipal revenue growth factor and determining the local contribution. So if every community got to their target, we'd be off of looking at MRGF entirely. So it's just further motivation to, to fully get there. Because just to put a fine, so the idea of one, everybody's target would, would be the pure set percentage of income plus set percentage of property wealth, and they'd be done with it. Steve? I just want to, uh, Jason, to applaud you because you've, you've looked at some of the inequities in, in a micro sense with the uh, target, and I do appreciate that, and we've talked about that. But you're also tackling the bigger issue going forward with looking at the uh, whole foundation budget. So I'm, for the first time, hopeful in many years that will be well, I think something good coming out. Note. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have nowhere to go but up in the week. Well, I think Steve, Steve's feeling positive because he still has a good, uh, healthy head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, yes, John. I don't know if I should ask this question. I'll pause it from But realistically, the commission has, is mandated to give a report by June of 2015. So it's not going to impact the FY16 budget. So realistically, are we looking at potentially the FY17 budget? Uh, I think that's probably true. I think unless they uh, report early or have uh, maybe you know, draft report early enough in the budget process next year. Um, you know, the budget process, as you all know, starts in January. Um, when the new governor will release, uh, you know, his or her, um, you know, uh, uh, budget plan, and then so we'll be well into the budget process already at that point. Um, so I think realistically, it, it, it could play out as we go through the, the FY16 fiscal year. Uh, but again, I think once this report comes out, it, it, I doubt that it's going to be something. I mean, the, the, the potential impact here is is, is huge. Um, you know, when you 
look at the ramifications for what might have to happen to the foundation budget and the formula itself. And I think it's realistically going to take some time to digest that and have the conversations right. that will need to happen in the legislature with the new governor, you know, with, with various stakeholders to say, okay, all right, now we, we can't deny this anymore. You know, we can't hide from it. But how are we going to address it? What, and start thinking about how to put together a plan. So, um, so realistically, I think that work could could come, you know, to fruition maybe by the budget uh, next year. Fair point. Seven. Yeah, Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you uh, all so much for being here. Thank you for the great questions and uh, and feedback. Uh, it's a really, really uh, knowledgeable audience. Thank you to uh, Luke and Colin for the great job of the work you do.